people love a Britney Spears moment because people love to know when you have fallen and then stand back up. Meet Berta Masso, leadership coach, HR strategist, and entrepreneur. She's here to teach you how to reinvent yourself. I became really passionate about helping people to reinvent. If you have a room with 10 people, nine of them will have a poor level of self-awareness. Do you realize the impact in the workplace? Is good talent the one that is just never gonna challenge the status quo? Is good talent the one that is saying yes to everything? Is good talent the one that has leaky boundaries? I think the world of corporate has changed a lot from COVID. Even if you allow remote working one day a week, that changes your life. We have to normalize quitting. Sometimes if you are not the one making the decision, Mr. Universe or life or God or whatever you believe in, it's gonna make it for you. What is it gonna to take to have more women at the top? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, a career coach, and the host of the show. Here we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well whilst doing it. Episodes are out every Tuesday. As you know, I'm going to be taking Anatomy of a Leader live to a location in London. If you'd like to attend, please add yourself to the waiting list. I'll link it in the show notes. When I was growing up, reading stories of knights on white horses, I wanted to be the knight. I wanted to have stories to tell. I wanted to have adventures. I wanted to achieve something important. I didn't want to be confined to the kitchen, as many a young man would have shouted out to me. It's a joke, they would say. Imagine what our world would look like if men were to look up to women, what it would look like if they were to feel inspired rather than threatened by them. Imagine what our world would look like when even young boys, without a hint of sarcasm, looking at a successful woman say, I want to be like her. Call me crazy, but I think it's exactly this that will create more gender parity in work, in business and at home. This is why this podcast, Anatomy of a Leader, is so important to me. That's why I want to showcase successful women as well as men, to have both sitting at the table as partners, challenging each other and making decisions together. My guest this week is Berta Masso, who happens to be one of the first clients I've ever had when I started my own company, HBO Search, 12 years ago. She's an HR strategist and leadership coach, and she's very outspoken about women coming out of the workforce and then very passionate about getting them back in there. She herself pivoted out of corporate HR to start her own consulting business. Very passionate about people, especially women, reinventing themselves and getting back in there. She talks about self-awareness and the power of reinvention. I really hope you enjoy this episode. As always, the best thing you can do to support the show is to follow and to subscribe so we can continue bringing you these amazing leadership stories. But without further ado, here is Berta Masso. Berta, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you. I'm so happy we made it happen. We made it happen, oh, yeah. finally. Isn't it funny that you were one of my first clients when I started my company and we never ever met until completely by accident, what was it, a few months ago at it was an this event. this time last year. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's been a year already. Um, yeah. So we were sitting literally next to each other. At a lunch. Mr. Universe. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> all things happen for a reason. <laughs> you know, I just walked into the room and I was so curious to see who were my neighbors. And yeah. when I saw your name, I was like, I know exactly who she is. <laughs> oh, isn't that funny? Yeah. Well, uh, well, nice to talk to you. And I'm very Thank excited you. to speak with Thank you. you. Um, for those people who don't know you, yeah, can you paint like a very quick two-minute yeah. summary? What's your background and experience? Yeah. So I come with a background of HR uh, in fashion um, across different countries because I first started in London and I worked for Burberry and Dior and then I went to the Middle East, which was awesome. And I worked um, for a sheikh that had uh, was the owner um of of uh, well the retail uh, partner of a super brand in the middle east uh great experience first in kuwait and then in dubai um and then i was br brought back to europe with my course back in 2010 um when my course had no no retail stores um and it was a tiny business of 10 million and it was a small head office we didn't really even know what was what was about to happen. Nobody actually had predicted that success. 
Um, and I worked uh, 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 with Michael Kors for those six years where the business went from zero to one billion. Um, I started in my, on my own and I left a team of, of 50 people across seven regional um, European offices. So the growth was, was incredible. Um, but with growth um, and all that success comes a lot of work, a lot of work. Um, teams were um, permanently understaffed, which means that you had to do like a million people's jobs, which means that you had to work seven days out of seven mm. um, long hours. Um, and after six weeks, that, that base uh, um, started to really be heavy. Um, and uh, I became a mother in the meanwhile. I'm not even sure how that happened, but uh, I, I became a mother twice. And, and it really was impossible to sustain mm. um, that pace and all that traveling and all that those working hours and having two little people at home. So um, I made a choice. Um, I made a choice of uh, 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 wanting to own my time. Uh, wanting to own my time in order to be present because I wanted to be present for my children. I still wanted to work, but I want I didn't want to miss um, certain things that I that I for me were important. And yet again, maternity is something really personal, and every single one of us lives it in our own way. Mm -hmm. And here it plays a lot of you know the way we've been brought up and and the, our relationship with our mothers and our values and so on. So it's really difficult. Um, you know, what works for me might not work for you or for, for others. But at that point, um, I said, okay, uh, I'm going to stop this. Um, me being me, I didn't really have a plan B, um, something that I wouldn't uh, advise people to do. Uh, I tell to my clients today, yes, you do reinvent. Yes, you do change whatever doesn't make you happy, but do have a plan. Do have a plan because it's cold out there. Um, and it takes some time to gain clarity. Mm -hmm. It really takes some time to gain clarity. And when you are running at 1,000 miles per hour for six years, you don't even remember who you are anymore. You don't even remember what's important, what do you want, what is it that you love, all those questions that you should know, you just don't because you haven't really asked yourself those questions for many years. Um, and so, you know, you have to work on your clarity. And to work on your clarity whilst you don't have a pay, then can be really stressful and you will not get clarity if you are stressed. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say to people, you know, do start that journey before you pull the trigger. You say that, but what you're also saying is that you were working seven days a week. You've just become a mother. Like, when do you find that? How do you carve out the time when your circumstances are like that? to be able to do that self-reflection. Could you have done it then, do you think? You have to. It's your, it's the responsibility you have on your own self. Um, and it's the responsibility you have if you want to show up as your best self, as a mother, as a, as a wife, as a, as a friend. You do have to find the time and the opportunity to block certain time in a, in a, in a week the week has seven days. You can block one hour mm. at some point um, to seek help, um, to talk with your network. We forget how powerful that is. Just get out, um, have coffees, talk to people, tell them where, what you feel, where you are, where you want to be, what is not working for you, what, what is it that you could change. Your network will help you. Um, you never will tell you, oh my God, I know this person. She's gone through the same, just gone through. And people make introductions and you know new people. And when you go out there and you start talking to people, there's that word that goes, you just clicks and you go like, oh, yeah. Um, there is that sentence. There is that new person that comes into your life. And everything is that those stepping stones that are really helping you. Um, to start a new direction if that's mm. what you want. Um, but I would uh, advise anyone before you pull the trigger with absolutely not having zero clarity and having a plan B, that's not sustainable. 
Um, you know, there's, there's bills to pay, there is schools to pay, there is stuff to pay. So you want to make sure that basic need is covered. We were talking about Maslow's, uh, the, the hierarchy of needs. Uh, and so that is a need, right? Finance. Um, you want to make sure that that is covered um, in order for you to allow yourself to go way up in the pyramid um, mm. and be creative mm. um, and be resourceful. And uh, uh, But you need to have the basics covered. So... Um, start to walk towards that new direction from you know your current chapter to make a move if you're not if you don't know what you want to do what you want in life you know you start to 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 to, to work on your clarity self-awareness my god like when you've been running like a thousand miles per hour for six years worrying about everything and about everyone but not you your self-awareness is just not there mm. so Six years, you know, working, relentless working, kids, no plan B. No. What happened? <laughs> so, um, so okay. I wouldn't say I was starting from zero because I knew what I did not want. So that is a start. I didn't know what I wanted. Um, and I knew I didn't want to work for somebody else at that point. So that was already like eight years ago. Um, because flexibility for me is and was very important. Now, mind you, this was before COVID. I think the world of corporate has changed a lot from COVID. I think it has become better. I, th I think with all this remote working and flexibility, we really have made good progress. So... All the decisions I made were based on a reality of pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I started my own HR consultancy. I just wanted to be free. I just wanted to be flexible. I wanted to do a few projects here and there. Of course, I had a wealth of network through all my tons of recruitment that I did in my course, pan-European. Um, so I knew a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, I thought, you know, I'll make myself, I will be this free resource that's, that zooms in and out to do projects. Um, some of them were recruitment. Um, How did you find that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, so I started with HR Consulting. There were some recruitment geeks that I quickly found out wasn't my thing. Uh, um, if you ask someone that has worked with me um, as a HR director, they will tell you I have a good, very good eye for talent. Um, and I have done tons of it with Michael Kors and, and everybody else I have worked with. Um, but I think the first lesson is not because you've done something a lot and you're good at it, that means that this is what you have to do going forward. Mm. Um, also... It's not the same to the recruitment when you are sitting in the office of an employer or being that person in the middle in between the client and the candidate. I didn't enjoy working on the other side of the fence. Um, of course, I was used to, to have some influence regarding the hiring decisions as a HR director and, and, and managing the talent teams and so on. So all of a sudden, not not having that that influence, maybe, um, and 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 ha and being the goal in between the candidate and the brands um, wasn't really where my talents were at best, to be honest. So mm -hmm. that didn't last long. Um, um, HR consulting geeks have always been long long ones for me so I have remained in businesses for like two or three years um, at the moment I have been in the same business uh, twice a, a day uh, 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 since 2020, 2020 yeah so it's been four years um, and I have always mixed HR consulting with uh, coaching because throughout my journey of self-discovery I became a coach um, I became or I became really passionate about helping people to reinvent um, especially, and that was both before COVID. So all of a sudden, Mr. Universe delivered um, and there was all these people that were looking to reinvent um, and I had done it for myself and mm -hmm. I had become a coach um, and, and the world was just starting to think differently. You know, a virus, you know, changed our lives yeah. and changed the way we thought and changed our priorities in a way. So a lot of people were not, okay any longer with spending four hours a day commuting um time became precious our friends our family uh became precious so people really started to figure out like wonder 
how could I live my life differently? Um, and so that was really rewarding. Um, and then recently I have transitioned into executive leadership coaching, which is really what I have done a lot of when I used to be a HR director. But answering your question, I have, you know, this dual hat of doing HR consultancy and, 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 and executive coaching. Mm. So you kind of, it's been a combination of following what you were doing before, testing some things, realizing that same, some things totally. are just like totally wrong for me. Totally. And then kind of like, you know, figuring totally. out and falling into like, that's the right place for me. Absolutely. Which is why, like some people, like that wasn't me because I just threw myself into something without having a plan B. But then you have the other side um, and you have a lot of people that would not make a move, would not make a change until they have everything absolutely figured out. You will never have everything absolutely figured out. And you need to start walking in order to get that clarity. And you need to try things and test them and see how they fall and how you feel. Mm -hmm. And whether you feel that alignment or not. And if you don't, don't be afraid to just just move on. Just yeah. cancel them. Just close and just move on and try something else. Mm -hmm. And perfection is the result of many tests and tries and, 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 and review and reset and improve and try again. Yeah. Um, it's a journey. It's not a destination. Will I be doing this? This time next year, who knows? Maybe I have just fallen in love with something else. <laughs> so, um, of course, there is always a common denominator, and that is possibly my passion for high performance, helping people to show up as their best selves. I love to know how our brain works. I love neuroscience. I love to understand how we can rewire our brain to just design the life that we want in whatever way we want. I know. And the people that, that have my knowledge know that you can actually achieve whatever you want in life. Mm. You just need to just need to know how. Um, you just need to work on yourself. You just need to understand what is stopping you from moving forward. You just need to really know how to why, rewire our brain, uh, your brain, so so it is not a blocker. So it is not holding you back. Um, and I'm super passionate about that. So whatever happens for me in the future, there's going always to be some elements of that. Mm. We'll we'll come back to that in terms of like how to figure out what you know what your strengths are, what you you value. But just want to backtrack a little bit in terms of you know figuring out when is the moment when is the right moment for you to quit. So huh. you know obviously there are moments when you feel like something's quite off or maybe mm. things are really difficult. How do you make a decision between do mm. I need to either just, you know, tolerate this or push mm. past it or it's like completely wrong for me? Yeah. So how I call these is, is it a dip or is it time to quit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it a dip or is it time to quit? Yeah. Um, and listen, I think we're coming from... Um, years where there's all these um quitters are for quitting is for losers um there is this negative stigma around quitting um and if you quit you, you're a loser you're a failure like something um but i think one of the greatest treasures in life is to have that self-awareness that you know when it's the end of something. And I think your superpower is when you're just capable to let it go, kind of surrender, like no hard feelings, no, I could have done this or the other, no blame, no shame, um, no anger. If you've done it for so many years, it was just wonderful as you lasted. If that doesn't make you happy, um, just move on. Now, sometimes it doesn't mean cancel it all and totally push it out of your life. That Sometimes it doesn't mean you have to make a turn of 180 degrees. Um, what it means is that look into that thing that is no longer making you happy and, and figure out the changes you need to make. Sometimes it just you just need to make some changes. You, need, you don't need to change it all. 
um, like, you know, my career as a HR director, the way I knew it in that specific way, in that formula, f- full-time job from, 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 from nine to five, Monday to Friday, that was cancelled. But I do so much of my old job in a different way that is more aligned with the way I want to live my life. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to change it all. You don't have from going from HR director, I'll, I'll think I'm going to just become a photographer tomorrow. You don't have to change it all. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we have to normalize quitting. I agree. Um, and I think we have to reframe and flip it and be, you know, make it, you know, it's associated with something positive. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, you feel less edgy about it. It's the same as, as failure. It's normalizing that it's okay for things to not work out and for it to be not completely the end. And I did a video called Quit or Grit, yeah. which is exactly looking whether you should stay or whether you should quit your job. Yeah. And exactly talking about how quitting isn't a bad thing. You just need to know what is the reason for you quitting. Like what's the other thing that you can gain? Yeah. What's the other, you know, what's yeah. the part of the end of the rainbow yeah. that you are working towards? Because I think if you're working towards something that is either no longer serves you or you've realized it's not your purpose, you realize you don't enjoy it, um, there's no point in putting yourself through pain to one day maybe liking it. You know, your your body and your your mind and, you know, that niggling feeling is telling you something. So it's like, what is it telling you? And learning how to listen to it. Yeah. So totally on board with that. And shall I tell you what? Sometimes if you are not the one making the decision, Mr. Universe or life or God or whatever you believe in, it's going to make it for you. <laughs> like yeah. how many times I talk to people that have been sitting in jobs and they have been hating everything about the company and about their bosses and about everything. They've been miserable for years and years and they haven't had the bravery on the courage to actually pull a trigger. And then surprise, surprise, the following day they're being made redundant. And then they're really angry. And you're like, why are you angry? You were hating that thing anyway. You're angry because that wasn't your decision. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like when in a relationship, it's like you were not happy, but you got dumped first. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So I guess the anger comes from not being a knowner of of your life and what happens to you. Do you think also the anger is partly to do with the relationship you have with the people there because anger comes from not being appreciated and when you don't feel it and then you're also you know quote unquote dumped then that also hurts I think also being pushed out touches your ego and you feel rejected and rejection is is not something people manage well you know, I think what, what holds people back is the not knowing what's next. Yeah. So that lack of clarity um, is holding people back. Lack of self-awareness and knowing what is it that they know um, that can be of interest to the world mm-hmm. um, is also holding them back. Because mm-hmm. when you are crystal clear about your talent um, and you're crystal clear about the transformation you give to your employer, to your clients or whatever... It's so easy to reposition yourself. Mm. How do you work that out? So how do you work out what your superpowers are? Yeah. So there are some tools that are helpful. um, And there is a lot of assessments out there that can help you to bring that self-awareness. But that's only only one way. Um, I would... Uh, go out and talk to my network, uh, my ex-bosses, ex-colleagues, ex-line managers, ex-team members, and actually I would ask them, what is it they think out of me? Um, and what is it? And I've done it myself. I've done to, to ex-clients and I've got to ex. And I would send them an email and say, you know, if Was you had scary? to... Yeah. Well, not really. Mm. Not really. And you know what? It's such a great exercise to do because you... Ask 10 people um, and they will say a lot of things, but they will say like four things that are the common denominators and that's that. Um, So if you say to these people, 
okay, just give me 10 adjectives that describe me out of the experience of working together or partnering together or whatever you know out of me. Just give me 10 adjectives that describe me. Um, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. That's exactly that's exactly what you give when you go to people to when you go to places. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tell people like when they go to interviews, um, and they and you ask people, you know, what are your strengths? Because you know that's a common question that you ask people in interviews. Um, and they will tell you, oh, I'm really good at people management. Um, and then. You're only scratch, scratching the surface. You have to, t- to ask that person, what is it that you do? Or what is it that you have that allows you to be a great people person? And then that person will say, well, I'm a great motivator. Um, okay, so what is it that you do? Or what is it that you have that helps you to be a great motivator? And then we'll go, well, um, I you know, spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, the passions and the values of the people that I connect with. Okay, so you see, a lot of people remain in the surface. So they don't really know what they're strengthening. Mm -hmm. You have to really peel that onion and really scratch the surface and go to the core to really know what is it that you do, what you have that allows you to be X, Y, and Z. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm a great salesperson. Okay, so what is it that you do or you have? Show me the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> like, what yeah. is it? What mm-hmm. is it that allows you to be a great person? Well, I'm a great connector. Okay. So what is it that you do that you have that you do that allows you to connect uh, so beautifully uh, with your clients or with your people or whatever? Mm-hmm. So you see, keep on peeling that onion to reach to the core, which very few people do. Yeah. It's like the CV that gets sent to you. <gasps> it's like, oh, Copy I'm a base. great, te- you know, motivated <laughs> team player yeah. and strategic dynamic thinker whatever (laughs) the the terminology is and Mm. you don't really see any concrete evidence no real tangible achievements because it's the things that you actually do like what you have delivered that make your experience relevant interesting and that's your superpower so I think saying all these like terms is useless because anybody can say them you have to show what you've actually done and I think this goes you know kind of answering answering your question for you is about digging deeper about your own like having like your own file of evidence like concrete things you have done that have delivered a difference or a change or a result and then look through those to understand what your superpowers are because those things the things you've actually delivered are your kind of golden nuggets of your experience but that requires a great level of self-awareness that not many people do research says that if you ask people whether they know themselves the most the most the most majority of everyone will say yes mm-hmm. and actually research says that only five percent of us are truly self-aware so if you have a room with 10 people nine of them will have a poor level of self-awareness if you have a department of 10 people, nine of your team members are going around the world talking to your clients and talking to their teams and doing business with a really low level of Mm self-awareness. Do you, do you, do you realize the impact in the workplace? It's massive. Like how people do not put their self-awareness at the very top of the priorities they have to work on is, is, yeah, I would never understand, Mm -hmm. but you know, you don't know how important self-awareness is until you have it. Because, of course, you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. So, of course, I'm saying these now that I have spent a lot of time and effort and energy and money to work on my self-awareness. And I'm just going like, my God, like, you know, how could I just going around the world and have all this big job with that low, you know, low level of Mm self-awareness? Like, you know, how do you show up? What are your blind spots? What is it that you did trigger you? Um, What is it that you need to do to be at your best? self every day in the office because there's a lot of things that you could be doing Mm. when did you discover your strengths it's a process it's not one day that you go like oh my god this is what I am this is what I do 
But there um, can be moments when you kind yeah. of have those light bulb moments like, ah, you know what? Yeah. You know, that is what I'm yeah. good at. Or maybe even on the other hand, like, this is it. This is yeah. the thing that's been holding me back. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you, reflection with it's not something people do a lot of. Um, but if you keep on looking back and reflect on your triggers, your drainers, what, what frustrates the hell out of you, um, you know what you're not being good at. If you look back and go like, okay, what were my best moments in life? What And what was happening then? And who with? And where was I? And what was the setup? Um, you know, when was the happiest at this given job? What is it that I was doing specifically? With who? You, you get all of a sudden a lot of information that you can actually um, bring forward. I'm laughing because if I, you know, I, I looked back at my, my job as a HR director and I realized that I was the happiest organizing the off-sites of my European team. Yeah. Um, so I would get everyone together and I would organize these massive events and I would get all these um, guest speakers and I would bring the business partners um, and it would be three days and we would work on our objectives and I would, you know, I had this joy of seeing people flying back to their countries where they would work um, with a clear mindset and focused and knowing exactly what they're meant to be doing and super proud of belonging to where we are. So that I brought to my next life um, and I created group coaching programs um, where uh, my team, where my clients that were coming from different walks of life um, and I would bring still the guest speakers who were not my business partners anymore but would be people from my own network of coaches. So people that would talk about imposter syndrome or people that would talk about, you know, money mindset or limiting beliefs around success or things that would really help my clients to unblock um, their full potential. And I did it using my intuition. And then one day I was like, oh, I have recreated what gave me most joy in a different environment, in a different context. But that was unconscious and I used my intuition. That was a full on. But I, I, I was able to connect the dots. Um, and I think you've got, you've got to, to, to really think you know, sit back and go like, you know, what's going on? What is it that I'm doing and why am I doing it? Mm. Do you have a process for doing that? Or is it like every Friday at four o'clock, no. I sit down and I no. answer these no, kind of questions? No, never. Shall I tell you what? I feel you've got um, the biggest reflections and the haha moments when you less expect him. And that is when you're having a shower, for example. <laughs> or... When you're on holidays. And there is a reason for that, um, um, which obviously neuroscience that I'm super passionate about um, will share with you. So when you are relaxing, your cortisol levels decrease. When your cortisol levels decrease, your, cre your, your creative mind awakes. And that's when you start to find answers to the questions you didn't find answers before because you were in the go, 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 go mode. So the cortisol, or cortisol levels are up. Your operative mind is performing. And in order to survive, your creative mind is shutting down. Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden, when you change the context and you cool down and you shut the noise, then all of a sudden there is this creative mind talking to you. Um, and going, hmm, I didn't notice that. Mm. There is a study, which I need to get the details of, which looked <clears throat> at the IQ of startup founders at the beginning of their <laughs> funding journey and at the end when the money was running out. Yeah, that... And the IQ level at the beginning when you have all the resources, you know, you you've, you've kind of like you've won, you, you don't have to worry about cash was significantly higher than towards the end when the money is running out. So this idea that stress and being under pressure actually makes you less intelligent and less creative. And I found that fascinating. Yeah. How, you know, we, we sometimes think of, you know, being on urgency and 
under stress and under pressure you when you're you know you're you're really you know trying to you know be creative and like figure out how you're going to get out of this but actually it's the opposite yeah and you know what there is again so much a stigma around um taking time off or prioritizing yourself um you know there is this oh you're being selfish or you're being lazy or actually it's your responsibility to actually give your brain a break because it allows you to see life differently um and you can go back to whatever you're doing with the different perspective that is actually beneficial to everyone so it's almost you know companies should actually push people more i think we've done a lot of uh, progress around mm. that um i think you know people are starting to know how important it is to actually take small breaks um you don't have to take months like you know a long weekend every now and then and you know remove yourself from that context mm. do you Different- think leaders are really getting on board with that and enforcing that in companies now I've seen a ch- I've seen a change. Mm-hmm. I've seen a change. I do I do th- I do think the leaders know now the importance of shutting down the noise and going away and change the context and having a good rest. Do I think they? they're starting mm-hmm. to know. When I was working in corporate that wasn't even a theme. I'm talking about 10 years ago, 8 years ago before covid, that wasn't even like, you know, holidays were not super nicely perceived or if you are on holiday you're still reachable and that you Mm. need to still be on call or answer emails or you know deal with certain crisis situations i think there is more respect for work-life balance today and there is a lot of employers that are being innovative about it Um, and those employers are the employers that are getting the best talent because you know people more and more really will not compromise um, their lives or even their, their own well-being. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there is this change? I think COVID has changed society and COVID has changed the way we, 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 we perceive the world. I think we felt so vulnerable all of a sudden. We never even thought for a second that was, could even happen ever. Mm-hmm. You know, we're so smart. We have created so much uh we're so technical so digital so everything here comes something totally out of the blue and has us shut down um businesses like you know people had to just stay at home a lot of businesses were not even equipped technically to actually allow their employees to remain connected you know i remember i was you know, I was uh, consulting for some businesses and we had our IT guy running around the city, going to the employees' houses, helping them to, con- to, to connect. It wasn't, you know, Teams wasn't, or Zoom wasn't even a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, never underestimate the impact. I mean, we hardly remember anymore. It's, you know, it's 2024. That happened in 2020. It's four years ago. Um, we don't even talk about that anymore. But it has changed our life forever. And it has changed the workplace forever. Um, And it has changed HR forever. And it has changed talent forever. Um, On what do we want and what is acceptable or not acceptable from our employer. From COVID days, talking to HR directors, so many are burnt out, exhausted, tired, replaced. What are your thoughts on that? I think that uh, the HR function has had a before and after COVID. I think before COVID, the HR function wasn't strategic, um, wasn't even perceived as such in many countries in Europe. Um, It wasn't really a business partner. Uh, And during COVID, I think a lot of business realized how crucial the HR departments had been in order to ensure that everything was moving and the people were there and the people were engaged even if we were at home working on top of each other our children were on uh, distance learning um, you were their teacher um, and you still had to work um, and so you know the, the people function people became such a it, it was really for once at the core of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we are post-COVID. Um, and a, there is 
a lot of entitlement. Um, there's a lot of businesses going bust. There's a lot of businesses struggling financially. Um, there is a lot of redundancies and layoffs. Like that seems to be the common theme that I've been talking. I mean, I've been in London for 48 hours. I've been catching up with my network. That's the only thing they talk about. Um, there is a very slim manpower levels, which means that people are doing two people's jobs. So again, we're going back to having to work crazy hours. <laughs> so we're going like, haven't we learned anything? <laughs> History repeats itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is that about? People stressed, you know, not, not thinking clearly, reverting back to their old kind of habits that they know that don't work and just... What is that? Well, I think people lack of self-awareness. So they do not realize or they do not notice when they are under pressure, they are under stress, and the new person they become when your world around you is shaking. They just don't see the signs. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's that self-awareness piece that comes back to our, uh, to our conversation. Um, and I will never get tired of saying it. Going back to... The idea of, you know, working a lot, having mm. kids, you know, women deciding that, you know what, it's just not possible to stay and control my time. Are you still seeing that? I think the world of corporate and the workplace has changed after COVID. I also know there is a lot of companies that are getting everybody back to the office uh, five days out of five, but not all of them. I think we are in a 50-50. There's a lot of companies that are going back to mm -hmm. that regime. But what happens is that they realize that a lot of the talent will actually choose the companies that allow people to work from home. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it's easier today for a woman, a working woman with a family, to actually stay in corporate because I do think businesses are more flexible. Um, with Even if you allow remote working one day a week, one day a week, that changes your life. I did ask one day a week when I was before COVID and they looked at me as if I had just said a swear word. It was like, what are you on Unthinkable. about? Unthinkable. Unthinkable. <laughs> yeah. And now everyone more or less gives one day. I think that the question is how much more days over than why are you going to give me? Uh, but the one day everybody more or less gets. And that is changing people's lives because, you know, that's less hour of commuting that you're doing a week. That's one day a week that you're able to go and drop your kids to school and pick them up. That changes people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think um, it's all a process. Um, and whatever, whatever woman that chose to become self-employed at whatever time in order to be more present for their families and have more flexibility... The world has changed now. She has changed. She's become a different woman over the years. The kids have changed now. The level of flexibility she will need is totally different. Does this mean that she needs to remain self-employed? Maybe she wants to go back to corporate. Mm. Um, and that is not easy. I think we have normalized people being self-employed and being freelancers and being consultants and being solopreneurs. 50% of the workforce actually is that. I think we have a normalized people switching from one to another. So what's holding back <clears throat> companies from... I think companies, I think people are being penalized when they've been out of corporate for a certain amount of years. How long is too long? How long is too long? <laughs> How like, long is like too long? It's like if you're like a year, five years, like where's the cutoff point? How long is too long? It depends on the, on the person that makes a decision. Um, but what you're seeing. But, you know, people should take a, a year off to go traveling. They might take some time off for parental duties, whether it's to look after an elderly or whether it's to look after children. People might take some time uh, out as a freelancer consultant because at that given time she needs or he needs a different life. Are we saying that these people that are not in corporate are not learning anything <laughs> whilst they are out of it? And therefore, going back means that 
you haven't grown enough actually i think it's the opposite i think you learn a hell of a lot of things that you would never learn in corporate you learn like, the resilience you learn to be self-led you learn to uh focus on your personal branding and the things that you need to do you know that to enhance your personal branding you learn how to sell like mm-hmm. hr people that are becoming self-employed or they're becoming coaches they never learn how to sell in their career in hr mm-hmm. because they don't have to so what's holding companies back from hiring you know people into from freelancing into the corporate there is this uh, wrong assumption that if you haven't been in corporate forever and permanently then you're not good enough you're not good enough yeah the time that you have been out it's a gap in your cv Mm. Have we normalized seeing gaps in people's CVs? Mm, no. Because I see a lot of people, HR, still go, looking at the years and the days and asking people, there's a gap here, what happened? Do you think it's because freelancers could be seen as high maintenance, that they just won't stand in your bullshit? Is that bad? Uh, no, but <laughs> could that be a way of thinking that it's going to be harder to culturally ingrain that person back into the corporate culture? I think we just have to go back to the basics and define what does good good talent look like for mm. you. Is good talent the one that is just never going to challenge the status quo? Is good talent the one that is saying yes to everything? Is good talent the one that has leaky boundaries? So if a freelance is not being allowed back into corporate because it has boundaries, and because it does challenge the status quo. Is that poor talent? Um, I think you've got to be a solopreneur inside of organization. Like everything you've learned out of it, you have to bring it back. Because in my opinion, it's immense value. The look for opportunities in, when there are difficulties um look for opportunities full stop um engaging connecting with clients team sometimes you were sitting corporate for so long you just forget how important all that is i wonder how much the interviewing process plays a part in this as well because you are if you're not trained enough to look for those qualities and skills beyond what's the most obvious thing on a CV, you're just going to be reverting to, you know, stereotypes and just be like, well, if they have been at this company, which is similar to ours, then they're going to be a good fit. And if they have done this type of a job and they're going into this job here, then yes, it's almost like using these shortcuts. Musical chairs, I call it. Like people moving. <laughs> a good term, oh my right? God, yeah. musical chairs, so boring. The world of fashion is full of it. Mm. How many CEOs we have seen going from bad to brand? I was just having a conversation just the other day going like, the CEO of X brand that is being moved to this other brand, what's the guarantee that that CEO is going to do a turn around and something amazing? Like, why are we not being innovative in the way we make senior appointments? Um Again, can we just please define what good talent looks like? And you need to define what good la- talent looks like for us, mm-hmm. which is going to be different of what good talent looks like for that competitor brand. But you really need to sit with your team and say, okay, what does good talent look like? Defi- let's define talent mm-hmm. for us. What is this talent doing? How is this talent behaving? Where is this talent hanging out? Where is it, how is the talent living? Like, let's define truly the profile of the of this person. Beyond has worked in XXX brands. Um, there is musical chairs since ever. We haven't changed that. That hasn't changed, and we wonder why fashion brands are in trouble this day. There is the same talent moving around. Delivering the same, same result. Same, <laughs> yeah. Are you disillusioned with the fashion industry? From a talent perspective, yes. Big time. Um, leadership is not always inspiring. Um, 
it's still very male dominated. You, you you want to count how many brands have a female CEO, um, and we would probably would have like like with one hand, it yeah. would just um, and you want to. There is a lack of diversity all around, not not in terms of gender um, and in terms of race, but in terms of the skill sets and the functions people that take the top positions come from. Why is that? Um, and you know what? They have no evidence that it's working because clearly, listen, there is a lot going on in the fashion industry right now mm -hmm. um, and it's not all roses. Um, so, you know, we say, well, um, if you want different results, you're going to have to try different things because to do the same, same, same and expect differently, that's insanity. The famous quote, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. but it's so true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is only one brand in the in luxury fashion that has, has really done something um, totally different and has appointed a, a CEO that is fem female of an ethnic minority that comes from a, a, was a, a chief HR officer for a consumer mega brand. So no luxury, no leather experience, no product experience, no... No fashion experience, no, no, no product, no finance, no anything. Why? Because she came with the leadership, because she knows under her there is all these teams of specialists that actually can deliver and can fill the gap so she doesn't know. But in mm -hmm. order to do that, you're going to need to stop micromanaging and, and allow people to actually do what they mm -hmm. were brought to do. You talk about Lena Nair? Mm? You talk about Lena Nair? Yeah. I'm talking about Chanel, has, who is the only brand that has done such an appointment in the history of fashion. Yeah. Yeah. What do you hope to see with having more women at the top? Empathy. Um, I don't, I wouldn't just say the woman, I just don't think women are best than men or men are best than women. I just think that you need a beautiful mix. Um, yeah, because when, when one does well, the other one not necessarily. So I think a you need a combination of both in order to have perfection. Um, but in, 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 the, in the fashion industry, in the luxury industry, it's, it's heavy male dominated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, all the CEOs I can think about are male um, and their line reports are mostly male. <laughs> so what is it going to take to have more women at the top you need to change the system <laughs> you need to change the system in which we live in because I think women still are the main carers um, for their families um, and if there isn't flexibility and work-life balance then regrettably still today these women have to make a decision whether they prioritize their career or whether they prioritize their family life. I don't think any woman should be made should make that 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 decision. Men are not being asked to make that decision. Why should we? I think it should be a partnership in any household. It should be a partnership in any company. And women need to be allowed to, to, to grow their careers if so they want with peace and serenity, with all that struggle, mm -hmm. with all that, sometimes it just feels impossible and sometimes it is impossible. Mm -hmm. Given the current structures, yes. And given the current system, I mean, I don't know in the UK, just the other day in Italy, um, there was an employee going back from maternity leave who cannot come back full time, even if she would want to come back full time, but she cannot. Because the place where she lives, there isn't any places in nursery where she can uh, leave the baby. There are not no places. And luckily, she can come back part-time because she has both grandmas, paternal and maternal, young and healthy and ready to step in. She said, if my mother or his mother wasn't there, I wouldn't be able to come back at all. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's a system that is not helping women to actually go back to the workplace. 
Like in Italy, people, uh, kids finish school at one o'clock. In Switzerland as well. One day a week, Wednesdays, they even finish at 11 o'clock. Like who, if you're working, like, and you have to be at home for lunchtime Mm -hmm. or 11 o'clock on Wednesdays, how are you going to do it? It's a system that is not working. It's the thoughts as well. It's the expectation that it's the woman's job to take care of the kids. Because if that wasn't really the undercurrent of the thinking, then it just will be simple. You would create structures to support that. But I do still find that this idea that it's a woman's job to raise the kids solely her responsibility yeah. without having the support of her partner who's expected to go out and you know do the full-time job and provide. Yeah. That dynamic permeates the working environment making it impossible for women to yeah. achieve that because you either it's like well I can have both so then you're doing two jobs at the same time yeah. or you're having to choose mm. and that's an impossible choice like who would choose not to be a parent or mother to their kids well you can choose not to spend as much time with them but who would choose voluntarily mm. to mm. not be a parent mm. Yeah. Even men, though. Even men. Like but still, I see you more. know, like, can we have a school that are open until five o'clock every day? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, mm-hmm. or, or else it's just impossible. Mm-hmm. Like, can we even have a schools that offer after, uh, after schooling homework support for all those parents that are coming back from work late because they're either traveling or they're either commuting? Because you know what? If you have to rush back home at five o'clock, And then do two hours or three hours of homework with the children. You're not even spending quality time with them. Yeah. Like, can you just kids go back to school ready to enjoy their evenings with with their parents without having to, you know, that stress or that exam or that. So I think the system doesn't work. The system doesn't work mm. and doesn't not only doesn't help mothers. I don't think that they did, doesn't even help the fathers. I think they do not. The system doesn't help parenthood full stop. It doesn't. And I think as a result of women entering the workforce and having to deal with these issues now, there's a lot of disgruntled women thinking this is not working. Whereas for men who haven't had to deal with it, they are completely unaware of the situation. I mean, I'm speaking for, I'm not speaking for everyone. Yeah. Because in, in my home, we're both fully aware how difficult it is to work and to take care of you know, yeah. kids at the same time. But for a lot of the time, like men didn't have to think about that. And so it's now the women coming saying, look, it's not working. We need to fix it because we can't do, we can't do it all. Yeah. Nor should we have to. Yeah. And it's holding women back. And I think this is exactly the problem. It's like this catch-22 where if there were more women in senior leadership positions, this would have been fixed a long time ago. Exactly. So you need to have the different perspectives to be able to see even the problems that can't be seen by whatever the status quo is. And that is the case for diversity and of thought, of race of gender of ideas of culture like we need that to be able to see that to make it work yeah but at the same time people female women cannot get to leadership positions unless <laughs> the system changes so it's almost a catch-22 yeah so i think about this all the time it's like how, what what needs to change because i had this question the other day it's like oh what do women need to do and i'm like women could there's this, we've done so many things already. I don't know what more you can do to make that situation better, apart from just becoming more angry and more <laughs> like frustrated forceful and more frustrated and like demanding <laughs> or like saying, I'm not going to be having any kids or I'm not going to be in a relationship at all until this is fixed because this is no yeah. longer working. It's not working. For my kind. But it's not working. We, we're not there yet. But we are in a way better place than we were 10 years ago. Like, we've made, like, massive steps forward. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal. There is a long road that's still ahead of us. Uh, But I think 
our daughters will certainly find a better place for them to actually manage their careers and grow them if so they want to. Mm. I hope so. And I mean, I do, I mean, I get very passionate about this topic, but I do see a difference, even if in my own career. And what you're saying, how in the corporate world that it's become easier to be a woman in business than it has been in yeah. the past. So there's definitely signs of that yeah. happening. There's still steps to be made, but it's it's an improvement. It's mm-hmm. just very, very slow. Yeah. Hmm. Looking what back... What do you say is slow? Is it really? I think like so. Like, imagine. Yeah. Like, all the changes we have made in such a short period of time. Like, listen... When I was in corporate, and that wasn't like young ago, I'm not that old. Um, you couldn't work one day uh, from home. You just couldn't. And I actually asked not even one day. I asked to be working from home only one afternoon. And that was like incredible. Like, what are you talking about? What, 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 in what parallel world are you living? Mm. And today, some of my ex-team members um, that are female are working from home three days a week. So I've, I've, I've seen with my peers, not even the generations below, like it's, it's happening mm. very quickly, actually. I think that's what COVID has shown, is that mm. if, you, if, you're, if push comes to shove, you can make changes very quickly. Yeah. Given the right conditions you can change overnight yeah. if you want to. So there's a lot of changes that can be made very, very fast, but they're not being made because there isn't really that... It's not a priority for many people. It, that's how change happens. It's like it can take forever until one day you're just like, can't take this anymore, and then you're a different person. It's, it's, it's managing both. It's like when you're talking about figuring yourself out it's it's a journey it takes time but I feel like it's not a consistent like upwards curve you it does take time gradually but you can make a massive change in certain points in your life that completely take you in a different direction yeah and I think that's what's amazing about our ability to make that change that you can have an experience or speak to a coach or you know as you said something happened even a redundancy can completely flip your way of of thinking on the world and and change your life for the better yeah i always advise to people connect with people that are on the same journey but away uh, ahead of you um why because they are on the same journey but ahead two because they are the living proof that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And when you shift your mindset from this is impossible, I'm not going to make it, to, well, this is possible because she has made it, and if she has made it, so can I. Mm -hmm. When that's that shift, then magic happens Mm -hmm. because you present yourself to the world differently, you make, you behave differently, you act differently, and that's when magic starts to happen when you sit in that place of this is impossible it's this this, you're sitting in a place of lack not abundance you're sitting in a place of you know not even trying because you know it's impossible Mm. um so i always tell people you know go out there and talk to people who are on the same journey but ahead of you a few years ahead of you first of all you can learn a lot from what they've done for has worked, doesn't work. That doesn't mean that it's the same for you, but you know what has worked and hasn't worked for somebody else. You can just, you know, you can you can take that as a good as a good information. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but then you know they are the living proof of that whatever you want is actually possible, mm-hmm. which is why they say you are the result of the five people you most spend your time with. For sure. Um, so. Surround yourself with people that are on your same journey but ahead of you because they're just going to pull you up. Um, their behaviors, their, their, their beliefs uh, what, around what is possible, what is not possible. Mm. Um, you know, all the opportunity you're, you will be able to see. Um, yeah, that if you, if you don't, so be selective. <laughs> 
Well, that's why this podcast is so important for me because it is showcasing stories yeah. of it's possible. Yeah. You can be that. Yeah. You can learn something. Yeah. And just having role models of both genders. I know, obviously, you know, I talk a lot about women's issues, but I don't interview just women yeah. on the show. And it's so important to be able to see all kinds of leaders and yeah. the stories about yeah. the challenges they faced and how they've overcome that. And they still yeah. made it, so to speak. You know, success is so personal to everyone, but just to mm. have those role models that you can be it too. Mm. That's why it's so important. Sometimes there is like, you know, you having we're having all these coffees or all these networking um the level of magic and learnings and wisdom that are taking place when two people actually connect and they exchange experience. It's like, yeah, why don't we share it with the world? Mm. I think that's what digital has allowed us mm -hmm. to actually take those moments of wisdom that will happen on a one-to-one -one level on a small cafe to actually share it with the world. Um, because it's that you know um social media can be a little bit you know people only like to share their successes most of the time um but what really really get people engaged is to actually share your failures um and know that you have been in a dark place too mm. um and yes it's not easy um and there are hurdles all, all around I call it people love a Britney Spears moment because people love to know when you have fallen and then stand back up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Become stronger. P -p people want to know more of that. It's impossible for everyone to be happy all the time or to experience success constantly because, you know, you see that Instagram feed and you think mm. everybody is just doing so much better than you. Yeah. And that's just not reality. You don't see the hardship, the, you know, smudged makeup yeah. because you've been crying or yeah. no makeup at all because yeah. you've just like not had the the yeah. energy to do that or to get yourself up and to continue on your yeah. journey. You know, life is life can't I don't want to say life is hard because yeah. some of the some of the guests on this podcast have taught me that actually, you know, life doesn't have to be hard. Yeah. But there are moments which can throw you off track or when you're feeling low and that's just part of life. Yeah. I will life. also tell you, choose who you follow in, link, in Instagram. You, you have that responsibility and you have that power. So you might just want to follow and look at the content of people that just, just, just share all the successes all the time or really the more genuine people that actually just tell it as it is. Mm. So yes, there is a lot of everything in life. You have the power to decide and you have the power to choose. So choose wisely. Mm. Well, this is what you're saying about self-awareness. What's important to you yeah. and being intentional with what you feed exactly. yourself and the examples that you seek out and the people you surround yourself with and who you reach out to. So. Absolutely. Well, Berta, how can people find you? I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn. That's that's my platform, really. Um, that's where I feel, again, self-awareness is key. Um, when I started my journey, I was doing everything. <laughs> Me not being a social media person, me not even very, I'm very digital. Um, and then just tuning in with what you like and what you don't like and actually choose your right platform, which for me is LinkedIn. Um, so you will find me in LinkedIn anytime, any day. I am spend a lot of time <laughs> in LinkedIn, of my day in LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, um, if you send me a message, I will answer. I will receive it immediately. So, <laughs> so, so, so I'm, I'm a LinkedIn brand ambassador um i love it um so yeah you will find me linkedin roberta thank you so much for coming on the show Pleasure thank to you. speak with you thank you so thank much thank you for sharing your wisdom thank you so much you've been listening to anatomy of a leader with me maria borostovsky if you like hearing these inspiring stories of leaders from all walks of life and would like to support our show the best thing you can do is follow and subscribe it really does make all the difference so we can keep bringing you these amazing guests Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next episode.